tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We are a wave of change and together we are unstoppable. Climate activist Greta Thunberg joins demonstrators at a massive rally and march in downtown Vancouver. Plus, an eight-year-old boy found dead alongside his father in their Coquitlam home. And... Oh my God, it's actually hit the car. Trees down, ferries canceled, Stanley Park closed. Powerful winds pound the south coast. This is CBC Vancouver News. We are not just some kids skipping school or some adults who are not going to work. We are a wave of change and together we are unstoppable. Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg addressing thousands of demonstrators at a rally in downtown Vancouver this afternoon. And as she has done all over the world, the teenager delivered a powerful message, scolding our political leaders, demanding more action on climate change. Good evening. Before the massive rally at the Art Gallery, Greta Thunberg joined thousands of people on a march through the downtown core. It came as 15 young people launched a legal case against the Canadian government for, they say, not doing enough on climate change. The CBC's Greg Rasmussen begins our coverage tonight. Build our future, not our pipeline! Build our future! This latest climate strike drew thousands onto the streets. Young people worried about what's coming and families concerned about their children. It's, their future is at stake and our whole planet's at stake right now. Um, we're a, this is a crisis that's right now and our politicians aren't responding quickly enough. With schools closed for the day, the march tied up downtown Vancouver for hours. These demonstrations are large, they're loud, and they're very energetic. But do they make a difference? It's really easy to feel like you as an individual don't have the power to change much. And it's really easy to feel hopeless. And I think when you attend these strikes and when you're here and you see the presence, you see you're not alone. The crowd embraced 16-year-old Greta Thunberg, who founded the Fridays for Future climate strikes just over a year ago. We are a wave of change, and together we are unstoppable. Her message with that familiar hard edge blaming adults for failing to act despite decades of warnings. If the adults really loved us, they would at least do everything they possibly could to make sure that we had a safe future. But they are not doing that. Supporters hope Thunberg's blunt message, backed by climate science, highlights the need for immediate action. I think people are shocked when they see people our age telling the truth about what's going to happen to our future and what's going to happen to the planet because it's jarring. It scares them. They don't want to hear it. A dire message in so many ways, but one wrapped in the hope of real change. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. And now to the lawsuit filed against the federal government over climate change by 15 young Canadians. They stood together on the steps of the art gallery to announce the lawsuit. They say the government has violated their fundamental rights by allowing global warming. The 15 range in age from 10 to 19 and come from all regions of the country. They demand a national plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Four are from our province, representing different realities, but common concerns from Haida Gwaii, Vancouver Island, Smithers, and Vancouver. Well, by any measure, today's march was a huge success. All ages, all backgrounds. Still, the majority who attended were young. Many came to hear 16-year-old activist Greta Thunberg. But as our Deborah Goble reports tonight, they wanted their own voices heard as well. Teach them well and let them lead the way. <laughs> but words like that can be frightening for young people when they've inherited a world they didn't create. Live childhoods filled with stories of environmental crisis and climate change. I really was like, why is this happening? Like, what can we do to stop it? What did you first think? Um, I thought that we we got to stop this one day unless we won't have our world. Rallies, marches, awareness, science. 
This is a generation that can't avoid the truth. Cut down on eating meat. I've tried to cut palm oil. I joined the environmental club at my school. Like I go to a coffee shop and I don't bring my mug like I don't get anything. Encouraging parents and grandparents to do the same. I regret that I didn't take action back in 1970, but I'm doing all I can now for the rest of the time that I have left. I ask the grandkids, uh, may I go on the art gallery? They, they see, um, tell me, you can go, Dadaji. You I, can I, go? Yeah. I think it's a start. Yeah. I don't think it's enough because, I mean, we're here and we're showing our support for it, but at the end of the day, we're not the people that can make changes not yet, at least. But this 16-year-old, she has created a spark that has started a fire. People always say you have to be the change that you wish to see in the world. And I think that's what everybody here is doing. And I feel really, really empowered to be here and that, she, and that she's here and that um, everybody is bringing their voices together to create like one big movement. Never underestimate the power of a movement. It is the year 2019, and the people in power are still acting as if there was no tomorrow. And we young people are telling them to stop doing that, to stop leaving their mess for someone else to clean up because we do not want to do it for them. I see her as like a superhero, like, you know, all the Avengers, like, because she's really making a change in this world, and I think that's what heroes are for, to change the world for the better. I think if everybody could be like her, then maybe we could save the world. Deborah Goebel, CBC News, Vancouver. To breaking news now, and the mother of an eight-year-old boy found dead with his father earlier this week in Coquitlam is now claiming she went to police before the tragedy and warned she feared for the safety of her family. The RCMP confirmed they are now reviewing their handling of the case. Our Eric Rankin is here live with the latest, and Eric, what happened? Well, Mike, late Monday, two bodies were found in a home on Seton Avenue in Coquitlam. Investigators revealed one was a homicide, but they had little more to say at the time. Last night, the mother of eight-year-old Oscar Tatinger revealed he was the victim of murder, and he'd been found near the his body of his 40-year-old father, Mark. Now, Nicole Tatinger also alleged she had gone to the RCMP back on September 11th, shortly after leaving the family home, and she told police she believed her three sons, Oscar and his two older brothers, were in danger. But she claims the RCMP did nothing and Oscar is now dead. We put those allegations to RCMP headquarters and while they say they can't speak to specifics, they say the handling of the case is being investigated, stating, we can also confirm there are factors involved in this file that meet our criteria to conduct a review and that review is underway. The review would include any possible circumstance or previous police interactions. The force says until that review is done, they aren't in a position to say more. And Eric, has the mother been any more specific in her allegations? Nicole Tatinger alleges she filed a report with the RCMP more than a month before the tragedy, telling them that her husband had guns. She says the RCMP never removed those guns and that her son is, quote, dead because the RCMP did nothing. No one believed me. Now, I should say the CBC has not seen the report she filed with the RCMP, but again, the force is saying they are conducting a review of her previous interactions with their members. Mike? All right, Eric. Thanks, Eric Rankin, reporting live tonight. Well, windy here in Vancouver for sure today and tonight, but a terrifying scene played out during a windstorm in downtown Edmonton today. Have a look. Now, the workers on that scaffolding are okay. The firefighters were on the scene within about five minutes. Crews helped get the one worker down, and he was checked over by paramedics. The other worker helped lower the scaffolding safely to the ground. The construction company is investigating this incident.
And plenty of wind for us today and uh, right now here on the South Coast. Our Brett Sauter home is live at Sunset Beach tonight with the latest. Brett. Yeah, Mike, it has been just an absolutely blustery day and it doesn't really show any signs of stopping right now. I'm down at the seawall, just kind of at the intersection of Beach Avenue and Cardero. And if you can see this behind me, the waves are really getting going quite strongly here. And while this has been inconvenient for quite a few people, you can tell that off in the distance there, there's some people that are kiteboarding and kite surfing, really just making the best of it. And uh, really at this time, it seems like people in Vancouver are just incredibly athletic, still running, still enjoying it, even though it has been a disruptive day. So specifically, the ferries, if you are not down there already, if you are trying to get over to Vancouver Island, it is not happening tonight. BC Ferries just encouraging people to stay home due to the numerous cancellations and the car waits. It's no guarantee that the ones that are scheduled for this evening are even going to go, and that's going to mean that you have to leave tomorrow morning by contrast. In addition to that, Stanley Park, which you can see behind me off into the distance, that is closed tonight. Nobody is allowed into the park until tomorrow morning at about 6 o'clock. That has, of course, led to some cancellations to the ghost train, which is disappointing for many people. But in addition to that power, this is a major concern throughout the afternoon. BC Hydro was reporting that approximately 20,000 customers were without power at one point. And in addition to that, we've got down tree limbs. And I wanted to show you a man who unfortunately went through a bit of a situation this afternoon when a tree fell onto his car. Take a listen. We're gone about an hour and we came back and uh, as we were walking uh, along um, 33rd, I noticed there's a tree down. I said, oh, it's in, it's in front of our car. Well, I hope we can get out. And then when we got there, I realized, oh my God, it's actually hit the car and we can't get out. And it was right across the whole street. Yeah, and that is just, of course, telling for these wind events. In terms of how gusty it has been across the region, Vancouver International Airport has peak gusts at about 78 kilometers an hour, and just across the water, we've seen gusts over 90 kilometers an hour. So it goes without saying, of course, seeing tree limbs down, that is not surprising, however unfortunate that may be, uh, to fall on cars. But it wasn't just Vancouver that was suffering through the wind this afternoon into the interior. Quenelle gusting up to about 94 kilometers an hour. And in addition to that, you can kind of tell the lights getting getting a little bit lower the sun is setting and the temperatures are dropping but there is some good news by the time that this wind dies down throughout the overnight period into tomorrow we're going to be looking at much calmer conditions not only for this weekend but well into the week ahead so when i come back i'm going to give you that full forecast and more all right we'll talk to you then thanks brett live at english bay tonight well some good news tonight for the sea to sky gondola in squamish 100 and 20 tons of it, to be exact. That's the weight of the massive metal rope or cable that has just arrived all the way from Switzerland to replace the one that was illegally cut. The company says the two kilometer long cable has arrived earlier than expected. That means repair work will be on track to get the gondola back in action in early of spring next year. Insulation experts are coming in from around the world to put it all together. The company says it's added new security measures to the operation. RCMP investigators say there was no natural or mechanical reason why the cable snapped at 4 a.m. August 10th, sending almost all 30 cable cars crashing to the ground. Well, a decision by Vancouver City Council on banning fireworks has been put off until next month. Council was expected to vote on a proposed ban last night after it heard from several speakers for and against. The BC SPCA is concerned pets and wild animals can be spooked by the noise and that can be put, putting the public at risk as well. Vendors say they are a beloved tradition for both Diwali and Halloween. Fireworks are already banned in Richmond, Surrey, Delta, Coquitlam and the city of North Vancouver. A BC Supreme Court judge has rejected the class action lawsuit against the foreign home buyers tax. The suit was launched by Jing Li, who argued that the foreign buyers tax discriminated against Chinese buyers. The judge ruled the 20% tax on residential property purchased by foreign nationals is fair. He says buyers from Asian countries receive equal treatment because the tax draws distinctions based on citizenship, not ethnic or national origin. Well, a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. The free app is also where you can find other CBC programming. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram.
Coming up, a CBC News investigation reveals violence in our schools is widespread. We take you to North Vancouver, where the school board there thinks it might have the answer. And thanks for staying with us online during the three-minute commercial break on CBC Television. Well, we all know his name, and we like him a lot. We read his books on cold days and on days that are hot. Now Dr. Zeus is being honored with a Toronto exhibit, and kids of all ages are expected to visit. Ali Chieson tells us more about all that's in store. Oh, the places you'll go for fun, like inside an old sports check outside of square one. Okay, I'll leave the rhyming to the doctor. Zeus, to be proper. With this experience, we, we like to imagine if he were here today and he walked through this, maybe he'd find it fun. And maybe... Like Dr. Sue's stories, the seven themed rooms have lessons of love and learning, starting with the Lorax. It is a fantastic room. Um, it's tactile, it's about senses, you can smell and hear the sounds of the truffler voice as we imagine it, and you can take a seat on a swing. The Lorax is such an important story. Right. It's just so relevant, it has been for so long with the environment. Absolutely, and it's, um, it's about preserving what's important. With this show, we're not, we're not uh, bombarding people with messages, but it's something we want people to feel. We want people to feel that something as beautiful as this should be preserved. What was your favorite Dr. Seuss book? The Cat in the Hat. He's a natural, look at him. He's here too, with thing one and thing two. This is the best kind of news story. It took designer Max Painter and his team about two years to bring the Dr. Seuss experience to life. So what book is this one based around? This is Did I Ever Tell You How Lucky You Are? It's about this poor chap who's taken his uh, machine apart and he just cannot fix it. So we've got a whole bunch of things over there you can break and fix and have fun with. This must have been so much fun to dream up. Lots yes. of work though, two years. Yes. How do you get inspired? Well, uh, the books themselves are very inspirational. What we're trying to make here is what we think the Dr. Seuss world would look like if it actually came to life. Clever use of the infinity mirror idea here too. We're not trying to make it about any one group. We're just trying to make something that truly is fun for the whole family. Can I count on you watching CBC Toronto News at 6 tonight? <laughs> of course you can. If I'm still awake, it's been a long day for me. I love it. Thank you, Cat in the Hat. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That was the Cat in the Hat speaking there, I think. Anyway, uh, love Dr. Seuss. That exhibit looks fantastic. Timeless. All right, stay with us. We'll be back with the latest national headlines in just a few minutes. Last night, we showed you part of an investigation by CBC News on violence in high schools and looked at a pair of life-threatening attacks on two boys trying to mind their own business. Well, tonight, David Common looks at the danger girls face, including sexual abuse at sometimes a shockingly young age. What happened in Cornerbrook was a horror for one mother, but so many parents were also left in the dark. Allegations a teenage boy was groping an eight-year-old girl over many months on a school bus. We've hidden her mom's identity. Yes, he ate it. Under, under her clothes, under her undergarments, yes. When you heard that, mm -hmm. what did you think? I was numb, shock. I just didn't know how it was possible that this, this could even happen on a school bus. She was even more shocked after the boy was charged at what the school did not do. How many other parents who had kids on that bus were told by the board that there were allegations? None. Like that? Zero. Zero, yes. They just didn't want to deal with it. They, they just wanted to sweep it under the rug. Keep it secret. Keep it secret, yeah. 
in our national survey of students, only one in four girls were completely satisfied by how their school responded after reporting an incident of sexually inappropriate behavior. More than one in four experienced unwanted sexual contact, including touching or grabbing, while one in seven girls had a sex act forced upon them by another student, including oral sex or touching their breasts or genitals. In the aftermath of the school bus allegations, charges were laid, though the court ruled there wasn't enough evidence to convict. Meanwhile, the school board says it's changing some policies. Should students assume that you've got their back? Oh, always. Always students should assume we have their back. And have you always been successful at that? I think it has been a learning process for everybody involved. The girl on board the bus moved to another school, something alleged victims repeatedly told us they've done to stay safe. So what are schools doing to create safe learning environments? North Vancouver has a unique approach to get at the root causes of violence. So we sent our Jesse Johnston to find out what they're doing. Every student in Mrs. Koningsfest kindergarten class can recognize how their classmates are feeling. Do you see her smile? How is she feeling? Happy. Koningsfest teaches children to understand emotions, just like she teaches the alphabet. I think this is the most important thing I teach. If, if you know, I do teach letters and numbers and reading and writing and all of that, but the first thing I start with is self-regulation. They really appreciated that. The school district explains teaching self-regulation like this give students tools to manage their emotions when they're young so they're better prepared to deal with them when they're older. Sometimes what we see is people being angry and hostile, but what we're actually seeing is an externalized anxiety. I'm freaking out. I'm, I'm so anxious. I don't know what to do. And so I lash out. As students mature, the subject matter matures along with them. They made so many variations of lessons and videos, like um, some were on like empathy and respect, whereas others were more on like bullying or how to deal with friendship problems in school. To know that like no one's really judging you and, and if they are then you don't need to be around those people. If you're having a problem at school with a friend you could just realize what is bothering them or how they're feeling and then change the way that you're treating them. Mental health is taught at high school too. At Mountainside Secondary, students get a special class called self-efficacy every morning. It's, it's a class where you discuss things and discuss how you can regulate yourself and emotions. It's nice to have like 20 minutes where you get to know each other and like it builds a sense of community. Violence in schools is a Canada-wide issue, but many violent incidents happen when a student doesn't know how to cope with something emotional. So her head is down and her eyes are down. Here, the idea is to make children understand their feelings at a young age so they can deal with them when they're older. And the result, hopefully, is a safe place to learn. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, North Vancouver. And for young people who need support, counselors are available 24-7 at Kids Help by phone at 1-800-668-6868, on social media, at Kids Help Phone, or by texting CONNECT to 686868. Well, a big day for many here in the Lower Mainland. One of the stars of the climate action fight, Greta Thunberg, was in town. We're going to talk to local leaders about what her visit meant next.
Here are some of the stories we are following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. If the adults really loved us, they would at least do everything they possibly could to make sure that we had a safe future. Climate activist Greta Thunberg joins thousands of demonstrators at a massive post-election rally in March in downtown Vancouver. Also tonight, the mother of an eight-year-old boy found dead with his father earlier this week in Coquitlam is now claiming she went to police before the tragedy and said she feared for the safety of her family. Eight-year-old Oscar Tatinger and his father Mark were found dead in a home on Seton Avenue. Police say they are looking into how the case was handled. And ferry cancellations, power outages, trees down, Stanley Park closed. A powerful windstorm is lashing the south coast. Well, Diwali, of course, is one of the biggest celebrations in the world for South Asians. And while it takes place on Sunday, there's a lot of preparation that goes into making it all happen. Between shopping for new outfits, gifts and sweets, it's a busy time for many including for the CBC's own Jason D'Souza's own mother, Sushma. This time, she invited him and us along for her trip to Surrey in preparation for the big day. So, uh, be honest, how excited are you when it's the only time? I'm so excited because there's all kind of shopping and all kind of excitement. Like, you know, some people, they buy new clothes and they gift it to each other, like family members and friends. And also, sometimes people, they buy new clothes to wear on the um, puja time, like, you know, the Diwali time, yeah. So I gotta be honest, it always makes me laugh just to see how big <laughs> your eyes get whenever we walk into a sari shop. I know, because it's so exciting, right? You, you look at all these new designs, you look at, like, what you can buy, what's in fashion, so it gets me all excited. <laughs> you know, clothes, they... They stand out and the designs and stuff, like what's new. And you just wanna, you wanna look good and you wanna feel good, right, in the clothes. So it's, it's very important. Yeah. So we're heading into a- Sweet shop. A sweet shop, one of the best parts of Diwali. Mitai, which means sweets. Sweets, yeah. Oh, it's one of my favorite parts. And there is so many different kinds, like, oh my God. Yeah. What, what's the uh, importance of having mitai or sweets during the Diwali? Well, you know how whenever you do anything, you start anything good, you feel like celebrating it with some chocolates or some sweets, similar, right? So you always start things with sweets and they're very important and um, you know how we just love indulging ourselves in sweets and stuff, so that's what it is. Is there something special about making it unique for yourself here in Canada, here in Vancouver and, and putting your own mark on it? Yeah, because Canada, like, we, we learned that it's so diverse, right? And we respect each other and we love to learn about each other's culture. So when you think like that, and it's a, it's a great time to enjoy in Canada with, with family and friends. Yeah, so it's, it's really great. Well, Mom, I gotta say, um, I enjoy the food. I enjoy the celebration, but, but most of all, I enjoy you being able to keep us cultured and, and, <laughs> and kind of bring that side of our lives. Exactly, right? You have to enjoy the best of both worlds. <laughs> so thank you so much. You're welcome. Happy Diwali. My, my pleasure. Happy Diwali to you too. And at 6.31, there's a gorgeous live shot of the sunset at Sunset Beach. Very appropriate. Well, as we showed you, a windy day on the south coast. Still pretty windy out there now, but it's shaping up to be a great weekend. Brett's forecast is next.
right, back to meteorologist Brent Soderholm, live at English Bay tonight. Uh, still windy out, but what a gorgeous uh, sunset there, Brett. Oh man, you should have been here to see it. I know we gave that live look, but uh, this was really one to start off a beautiful weekend ahead. It is definitely still gusty, and that is going to be the trend for the overnight. But all of this is going to pay off because this is clearing out all of the clouds, and this weekend and beyond is looking beautiful. I wanted to show you right now what our current winds are at. These are sustained winds. A live look at this right now, just to show you that we'd be around 56 kilometers an hour here in Vancouver. And if we look at what those wind gusts would translate to instead, that would still be closer to about 80 kilometers an hour here in Vancouver, looking at about 78. Now, as I mentioned, throughout the overnight period, these winds are going to be calming down, but slowly but surely. So for the remainder of the overnight, or sorry, for the remainder of the evening and getting into the overnight period, that is, it will still be blustery. But by first thing tomorrow morning, it is going to feel like a completely different type of weather. And if you've got any plans this weekend, anything involving outside, you are going to be in luck. Here is a look at your weekend planner. Clear skies throughout the remainder throughout the overnight tonight five degrees or so is our low but tomorrow a few clouds are possible first thing in the morning we're looking at mostly sunny skies though getting into the afternoon it's going to be about a high of around 12 degrees which is seasonal come sunday a very similar story it is going to be very sunny 11 degrees but it is really worth emphasizing how chilly it is going to be on these overnights this is all thanks to this ridge of high pressure that we've got stationed over the pacific right now you can think of this as something that's a protective barrier so it's preventing all of that rain that you're going to see go up toward Alaska that is going to just be stuck up there and not have anything to do with us here in southern BC and this is not just for the weekend I keep emphasizing this is going to be for the next few days and even getting into next week so this would be called a very stable pattern at this point in time what that translates to overall for our five-day forecast I mean this is just looking pretty astounding we have nothing but sun in the forecast for the next five days and temperatures there especially throughout the afternoons are only going to be be, or rather they are going to be in the double digits so that is great but it is down towards those overnight periods we're going to see lows once again going back down into the low single digits so if you've got any adventures planned for the late overnight periods definitely bundle up otherwise enjoy it while you can we will thanks brett live at english bay tonight While fires are ripping through the state of California, now two million people may have to have their power cut off. We'll tell you why next.
I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Get your tickets to the Chutzpah Festival today. Catch culturally diverse performances in comedy, music, theatre and dance at this one-of-a-kind festival. And join CBC Vancouver's Mike Colleen on November 5th as he hosts this year's Power 50. He'll reveal this year's movers and shakers according to Vancouver Magazine. For more on these events, check us out online. Tens of thousands of people were forced to flee their homes in suburban Los Angeles overnight after a small wildfire suddenly exploded and turned far more dangerous. We have over 15,000 structures throughout the footprint of this fire that are threatened with over 40,000 people that are evacuated. The fire was whipped up by Santa Ana winds in the middle of the night, jumping a highway and moving into residential areas like Santa Clarita. Several homes were destroyed despite efforts by water bombers and at least 600 firefighters. Crews are also struggling to control a separate fire, this one in Northern California because of high winds. About 2,000 people have been forced to leave their homes there. Today, a utility company admitted its electrical equipment may have ignited the fire. The CBC's Kim Brunhuber is in California with details tonight. 50 kilometers northwest of Los Angeles, an ember from the Tick Fire touches off this patch of dry grass. In these winds, a small fire like this could burn down a neighborhood. But out of the smoke, just in time, firefighters. About 300 meters away, watching yeah. nervously from their deck, Heidi and Mike Moody. It was like Armageddon out here last night. Last night, this fire spread all the way to their backyard. What's it been like with the fire so close? It's scary. I mean, last night we thought for sure we were going to lose this place, but uh, the uh, water dropping helicopters saved it. Some of their neighbors weren't as lucky. High winds and dry air have sparked several major fires across California. Tens of thousands are under evacuation orders, but the Moody's decided to stay. We slept down in our field in our trailer because uh, the fire was its still burning down below us here. They're also among the hundreds of thousands of Californians without power as utilities shut off electricity to prevent downed lines from sparking fires. But in at least one case, those precautions may have failed. In rural Sonoma County, the massive Kincaid fire burns out of control, growing at a rate of about 30 football fields a minute. Dozens of buildings have been destroyed. Now the state's largest utility company admits a power line broke in the area and at the time the fire started. The transmission line was not among the lines we de-energized in Sonoma County. We still at this point do not know exactly what happened. This is the second major planned blackout in two weeks, and officials warn the forecasted high winds mean there will likely be more this weekend, affecting as many as two million people. The Moody's are dreading nightfall, scanning the valley, looking for the return of that baleful orange glow. While right below them, the firefighters vanish from sight into the billowing smoke. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Santa Clarita, California. Riots and rallies blocked the streets of Santiago, Chile for the seventh day in a row. And again, police clash with protesters. <laughs> Police used water cannons against the demonstrators. The rally started a week ago when the government raised the price of subway tickets, an increase that has since been suspended. But the anger continues. It's become a protest about social injustice. Hundreds have been injured or arrested. Crowds chant, we are at war and we are fearless. The president is promising social reform. Meanwhile, a state of emergency and curfews continue. Longtime U.S. politician Elijah Cummings was laid to rest today, and among the mourners attending his funeral, two former U.S. presidents, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. There's nothing weak about looking out for others. There's nothing... There's nothing weak about being honorable. You're not a sucker to have integrity and to treat others with respect. Cummings was chairman of the House Oversight and Reform Committee and wielded considerable bipartisan influence. He died last week at the age of 68. House of Representatives suspended its business, including impeachment investigations today, 
as a mark of respect. Cummings was remembered as a civil rights leader and for his deep sense of integrity. Indonesian investigators are blaming Boeing for the fatal crash of a 737 MAX 8 jet. All 189 people were killed last year in the Lion Air flight. The report criticizes the design of the plane's anti-stall system and also points to distractions on the flight deck. That crash was followed a few months later by another fatal accident involving an Ethiopian Airlines MAX 8. The plane remains grounded worldwide. Police have now arrested three more people in the UK's suspected human smuggling tragedy. And we're finding out more about one possible victim who may have been among the 39 dead. As Renee Filipponi reports, a young woman originally from Vietnam sent a text message to her family, apparently realizing her time was about to run out. Throughout the day, bodies were taken by ambulance to a nearby hospital. Autopsies are now underway, not only to determine how they died, but look for any clues to find out who they were. Beijing is urging UK authorities to confirm the identities, verify the facts, and punish those responsible. The Chinese embassy in London has sent a team to Essex. Despite early police reports all the victims were Chinese, it may not be the case. The family of 26-year-old Pham Tra Mi believe she died in the container. From a poor area in Vietnam, her family says she paid $50,000 to smugglers, hoping for a better life. At the time the container sailed to England, she frantically texted her family. Translated, it says, I'm sorry, Mom and Dad. The road abroad is not successful. Mommy, I love you very much. I'm dying because I can't breathe. I'm suffocating. Mommy, I'm sorry. They haven't heard from her since. A number of other Vietnamese families are also concerned about missing loved ones. Chief Constable Pippa Mills. Today, three police. more arrests. This is a fast-moving investigation involving significant police resources. A man was arrested at Stansted Airport and a husband and wife taken into custody in Thank northwest you. England. Thank you, guys. All three on suspicion of conspiracy to traffic people and 39 counts of manslaughter. The driver of the truck is still being questioned. Trafficking happens um, very often into the UK. This advocate says trafficking networks are complex and difficult to investigate. If it is indeed a complex organized crime ring, um, there would be lots of pieces perhaps across many different countries and many different continents. As the investigation continues, the numbers will turn to names and their suffering in the back of that container becomes more real. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Well, Canada's Margaret Atwood added a new award to her slew of international accolades today. This time a prestigious royal honour presented by the Queen. In an emotional ceremony, Atwood accepted the Order of the Companions of Honour. She was thanked for her years of service to literature, including writing more than 40 books. Atwood has won many prominent British awards, most recently the Booker Prize for The Testaments, a sequel to her landmark work, the Handmaid's Tale. Well, as we've been telling you, thousands of people turned up today to join Greta Thunberg in a climate strike in downtown Vancouver. Many of them teenagers, just like her. Our Dan Burritt caught up to some of them after the rally to see how Thunberg's visit impacted them. A huge crowd for uh, Greta today to hear what she had to say. What was it like having her here in Vancouver for this day? Well, I'm really grateful that she came the whole way from Sweden just to strike with North American strikers. I really appreciate having her here and the energy she brings. Um, that said, the movement in Vancouver is very strong and has been very strong for a long time. And the people who showed up today have been showing up consistently for climate. Um, and Greta knows that and she's here to strike with us. So it sounds as if the, the, you've already got a strong movement, as you said, behind it. What do you think she added to, to the event today? I think she added a lot of energy and a lot more commitment to the, uh, to the movement itself because I think a lot of people came out and to, to see her and see it kind of solidify with her presence. Yeah. Now, on an individual level, because we saw the movement today, um, what are you two doing to uh, fight climate change on a personal level? 
On a personal level, I voted. I'm encouraging every adult in my life I know to vote, um, now that I finally can. And even in the days before I voted, I'm taking to the streets, I'm writing my politicians, I am doing everything I can to get my voice out there politically. Um, there's a lot of pressure for us to do little individual actions in our lives to fight the climate crisis, and those are important too, and I don't eat meat, and there's many other things I do, but the focus needs to be on getting political change, yeah. because those little individual actions in the end are just another way to place the responsibility for the climate crisis on us instead of on corporations and governments that haven't done anything about it. You are 17, uh, one year away from being able to vote. Um, you are 18 and were able to vote. Do you think there's a, a, a more of a sense among young people who are able to vote that they realize how powerful and important that can be to affect policy? Yeah, there are a lot of 18-year-olds that just turned of age that wanted to go vote, and they were really excited. I saw it on their Instagram stories, they're the I voted sign. And But there was also a lot of people my age who were frustrated that I couldn't vote. Like, I wanted to vote um, and make a change in my writing, but I couldn't. And I, I'm from White Rock, so it's a pretty conservative community. So I really wanted to make a change, but I couldn't really. Um, but what I did was just make, tell my parents and tell a lot of adults and my friends' parents, well, my friends to tell their parents to vote as well. And take to the streets also. That's yeah. why this movement is run by young people, is because it's the only way that we have a political voice. And lastly, when it comes to, to older people who are perhaps either skeptical of climate change, skeptical of the movement, what do you tell them when they see this out here? I tell them it's this or it's fires. I, climate change is coming whether they care or believe about it or not. Um, and it's unfair that it's our generation that's been left with the worst effects of it. Um, but regardless, they can either see us in the streets trying to make a change or we can all suffer the consequences. And I, they, they, they're not going to be here. We're going to be the ones suffering and we should they should support us because it's our future, it's their grandchildren, and it's their grandchildren's grandchildren, and it's all our future and not just theirs. Thank you very much for joining us. Well, it's not aquasize or pickleball or lawn bowling. Coming up, we introduce you to some seniors who are getting fit and stretching out in another way.
CBC Vancouver is proud to be hosting Indigenous Junior J School November 13th. We've invited Indigenous students from across the Lower Mainland to come and learn all about a career in journalism. For more information, head to cbc.ca slash bc. Well, gymnastics classes aren't just for kids. The Millennium Gym in Vancouver is running a gymnastics pilot program for people over the age of 65. We went to one of the classes to see what exercises the seniors are learning to help increase their strength and agility. And we're here at our Millennium facility and we're about to run our second ever Seniors Can Move gymnastics class. We're gonna start with our stretches just like we did last week. Gymnastics involves a lot of balance and coordination, strength, agility, all important things for seniors because um, we're trying to help prevent any falls, um, help them keep more mobile and keep them more active, um, and gymnastics is a great way to do that. My name is Shannon Wong and I'm 69 years old. And I thought it would be good um, because it's all about balance and they had said um, that uh, they were going to teach us about falling and I just fell a month and a half ago and sprained my ankle so okay I think I should go to this. The first week you're a little unsteady, the second week you're feeling a little bit more confident and it's like oh yeah I think I can do this better so I'm expecting by the end that I, I should be balancing pretty good. <laughs> My name is Eleanor Grant, called Ellie often, and I'm 77 years old. I really need to improve my fitness and my endurance, and uh, this just looked like something a little different that would be interesting. So there's, um, you know, walking on a, a narrow line, trying to keep our balance, and balancing with eyes closed while standing in various positions with our feet. Well, you know, I have two uh, very precious little people in my life within the last few years, a two-year-old toddler and a new infant, and they're my only grandchildren, and certainly being in fit condition and being able to have better endurance and balance is very important to me and in my interactions with them, so I have a big incentive right now. Great job, everybody. Yay. This class is open to anybody um, over the age of 65 who's wanting to try something new, to have fun, to improve your fitness, improve your balance, coordination, fall prevention, everything. Um, it's open to everyone. Well, last year, a Mexican movie, Roma, you may recall, was the toast of Hollywood. This year, it's a Korean film that's getting the same kind of Oscar buzz. Parasite weaves a tangled tale of young con artists who target a wealthy family. Eli Glasner has more on what many are calling a must-see movie. Parasite is a portrait of the two ends of the economic spectrum. There is the world of the Park family. Their house is an architect's dream, a jewel box of luxury. They live at the literal top, perched on a perfectly manicured hill overlooking the city. At the bottom, in their dingy basement apartment, sit the Kim family. Things are so bad when the city sprays the street for pests, it's an opportunity. This is the life of the Kims. What can you get to get by? Parasite is set in South Korea, but it could be Vancouver, Toronto, San Francisco, any place where the chasm between the upper and lower classes seems entrenched. But then the son's friend, someone slightly higher on the economic ladder, gives Kiwoo a lead, a job tutoring the park's spoiled princess. Thing about the Kims is there's always a plan. As soon as the Parks accept Kiwu, he spots another opportunity. The Parks have a difficult child, and Kiwu just happens to know the right instructor. Perhaps it's because the theme of economic anxiety seems so prescient in 2019. Parasite is just one of a number of films exploring the spaces between the haves and the have-nots. Look at the bitter class divide of Joker. First you must ask yourself, are you wealthy? Or the economic farce that is the laundromat or what's driving the bump and grind of hustlers. But none come close to detailing the moral cost 
as parasites. There's so much more I'd love to tell you, but here I want to respect the director's wishes, who recorded a message saying, with careful manners, we could have the best time together. You will have the best time with this savage and spectacular social satire that rates five stars out of five. That's right, it's remarkable. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Five, rare from Eli. All right, that's it for us tonight. As we uh, leave you, we're gonna show some images of the climate strike protest attended by thousands in Vancouver today, along with climate activist Greta Thunberg. And you can always watch CBC News online, cbc.ca slash bc, or on CBC Gem. Dan's here at 11, right after the National. Thanks for watching tonight, and have a great weekend.